You know, there is nothing more powerful in all of human history than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Nothing more powerful in all of human history. And though they prophesied hundreds and hundreds of years prior to Jesus' arrival that the Messiah would come and that he would rescue his people, the way in which Jesus chose to bring salvation to all of humanity was completely unexpected. You know, Misty and I have been in the ministry for a long time, for all of our adult lives. And you know, we have found a very, very common misconception among so many people that we meet. And maybe you're that person that you've believed the common misconception that says this, my life can't change. Have you ever said that to yourself? Maybe you're saying that to yourself right now in this season or in the situation that you're in. My life can't change. What voice is that that you've been listening to? Maybe you look at your, your marriage and it's just completely falling apart. Maybe your finances are in shambles. Maybe you're dealing with a, a physical illness, some sort of ailment that's brought limitations to your life. Maybe you've dealt with depression or anxiety or even suicidal thoughts. Maybe you've said to yourself, I've done so many things wrong. There's no way that God could ever forgive me and use me the way I see him using other people that I know. My life can't change. You know, the very essence of the resurrection story, Easter, is all about change. That's what the resurrection is. That's the meaning of it all. Jesus himself, when he died and he went into that tomb, he went in with a mortal body. Though he was 100% God, he was also 100% man. But when he raised up to life on that third day, he raised up in a new, transformed, glorified body. There was a change. Say change. There was a change. So resurrection in itself is all about change, which means through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, your life can change. You know, when you think about resurrection power, we think about the fact that Jesus took our sins. He was buried for those three days. He resurrected in power, but we don't often apply that to our life. And how does that power work in the everyday life of the believer? We wanna help you to understand that today as we're talking about the fact that our life isn't just about inviting Jesus in, but it's about truly transformation. When I look in the Bible and I study the New Testament, you can read the account of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection in each of the gospels. But today we wanna to take you into a different place in the word. A guy who understood change, a guy who understood transformation, he wrote 1 Corinthians. And he wrote it to a church. And I'm talking about the apostle Paul. I'm talking about a guy who understood complete and total transformation. If you don't know this guy's story, before Christ, he was literally completely against Christians. He was literally going out, having them arrested and, and literally wanting to put them to death when Jesus got a hold of his life. And I'm here to tell you his part of the story. You can read it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You begin to see him talking about the power of the resurrection. And the apostle Paul said this about the resurrection. It wasn't just a one-time event. And you're like, what? No, it, it's not just a one-time event. You see, there's coming another day with another resurrection. I wanna read this to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 20, and it says this. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first, say first. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. They're talking about those who have already passed away. You see, just as death came into the world through Adam, we talked about this last week, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, sin brought forth death. And death was a separation 
between us and God. That came through Adam, but it says, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. We know that man is Jesus. He overcame death, hell, and the grave and got victory that day he came up out of the grave. Just as everyone dies because all belong to Adam, all of us will die a physical death. Everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. Say new life. This is the promise of the resurrection, new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised first of the harvest, then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. What is he talking about? He's talking about the fact that there's going to come a day when Jesus comes back. You see, he not only resurrected, then he spent the next 40 days literally going out and still teaching and letting people see his glorified body, that change that had taken place. Then he ascended into the heavens. But the Bible says that he's coming back. He's coming back for a people group. He's coming back for a spotless, pure bride. You jump on down to verse 51 and it says this, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Say changed. This is what the resurrection was all about is this change. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. You see, there's coming a day when those who are already asleep in Christ are going to be resurrected. Their physical bodies are gonna be resurrected as Jesus comes back. Each of us have the opportunity though today to make a decision to allow Christ to transform our life while we're still living. You see, the fact is, having been in the ministry for so long, Brad and I have watched so many people say yes to Jesus. In a moment where they feel God's presence, and you say, yes, Jesus, come into my heart, forgive me of my sins, but then your life doesn't change. And you're still dealing with depression, and you're still dealing with anxiety, and you're still dealing with a broken marriage, and you're still dealing with addiction. And I'm telling you, when Jesus went to the cross, he went to take the sins that we were going to commit, but he also went to give you freedom over the past, over the junk that we would deal with. But guys, the fact is, it comes down to the fact that so many times we don't tap into the power of the resurrection on a daily basis. Philippians chapter three, verse 10 says this. This is Paul again. He says, I wanna know Christ and I wanna experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I wanna tell you today, if you want to experience the same power that raised Christ from the dead, it's available to you. That resurrection power is available to you that Paul's talking about, but it will only happen when you completely die to yourself. See, resurrection was only possible because of death. And the reason so many believers continue living in bondage is because they don't fully surrender themselves to Christ. They don't fully die to their flesh. They don't fully put to death the things of the past. And if you wanna experience that change, today it's possible if you're willing to fully surrender. You know, there's a lot of speculation and doubt and debate when it comes to whether or not Jesus truly raised from the dead. You know, it was a long time ago. And so there's people who doubt this. And though, you know, we could, we could spend time today just lining up all, all the provable, you know, facts and the evidence built around this case as to whether or not he raised from the dead. But you know, the, the strongest piece of proof that is before you and I each and every day is seen in the lives of those who have invited Jesus into their heart. A changed life. I can't think of any greater evidence that Jesus is real and he's, he's living inside of the hearts of his people than when you see somebody who you knew before Jesus and you knew they did not act like Jesus. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about. And then something happens when they invite Christ into their life. There is a transformation. There is a change. Something happens. They start to act different. They start to talk different. They start behaving different. Doing things that are completely outside of the, 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 the natural way of the way they used to be. You know, I know, I know for myself. You know, I, I, I grew up, you know, in, in, in church 
And as I entered into those, you know, 12, 13 years old, into my, my teenage years, into junior high and high school, like any other young man, strongly battled with temptation. You know, sexual temptation and uh, temptation to just be approved by other people. So there was lust and there was greed and there was pride. I had a filthy, horrible mouth. And you know, ever before marrying Misty, and this is, I, I hate even mentioning this, but it's a reality that many of us in this room can, um, can relate to. And that's having been with someone else that you weren't married to before you marry the person that God has for you. And I made those mistakes. And, and so as I just stumbled through this journey of trying to find what I thought would make me happy, chasing after you know, money and just position and title and approval from other people and, and being with different women and all these things that, that, that the world tried to convince me would make me feel full. Adoration and, and people's attention and their praise. I thought that that would make me so satisfied and so full only to find out at the, as I was making my way down that path, I was completely bone dry empty. There was nothing there. I believed a lie. I believed if I can make enough money, I would be happy. And I started making money and guess what? I began to feel more and more empty because I was chasing the wrong thing. You see, what I really wanted deep down wasn't a thing, it was a person. <laughs> and his name is Jesus. And when I found him, I'm telling you, my life changed. Did I still have temptation? Yes. Yes, but I invited Jesus to live inside of my heart and he began to deal with my mind. And I surrendered everything to him and I said, God, I don't want to chase those things I was chasing before. I don't want to be empty. I want to be full. I want to have joy. I want to have peace in my life. I want to be satisfied and I want to find all of that in you guys to so just wreck me and change me. And I'm, I'm so tired of being tired of trying to do this thing called life on my own. I, I want what you have for me. I, I want your version, your best version of my life. God, will you give it to me? When I made that decision, my life changed because I surrendered to him. And I said, God, none of me, all of you, that's it. No shortcuts all of you. I'm standing before you as a proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus is living inside of me. Romans 8 and 11 says, the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Those of you who've called upon Christ to live in your heart, he lives inside of you. And just as God raised Christ from the dead, he will give life, say life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living within you. You want your life to change? Get Jesus inside of your heart and give him full control of everything and you will not even recognize yourself. That's the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and you can experience that today if you will just say yes to Jesus and no to self. Is it easy? No. It's horribly hard. It's horribly hard, but you are made more than an overcomer in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's only because of him. So today, I just wanna know, do you want your life to change? This is the moment that God brought you here to hear this message so that you could know that there's still hope. Let's bow. Father, we are grateful that you didn't just leave us hanging. You didn't leave us high and dry in our sins that led to death, but you sent a sin solution. You sent your one and only son, Jesus, who gave his life willingly to die for us, that through his resurrection, we would experience life and life more abundantly. So Father, I pray for that person right now, either watching online or in your house today that has said, my life can't change. God, convince them right now by the power of your spirit that it can and that they have been listening to a lie from the enemy himself. I speak against depression and anxiety. I curse thoughts of suicide right now. I curse thoughts of fear. I curse these thoughts of doubt. 
that's dwelling inside that person's heart that hears the sound of my voice right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, your life can change through the resurrection power of Jesus. With heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe you're one of those people you have not invited Jesus to live inside of your heart and that's the decision that you need to make right now. You have come to the right place because God loves you so much and he got you here this morning because he wanted you to hear this message and right now by his Holy Spirit, he's speaking to you and you feel this tug and this drawing inside of your heart, that same pull that I felt the moment I gave my life to Jesus. And that voice right now is telling you, identify right now that you like all humanity are sinners in need of a savior. Ask God to forgive you of your sins. Believe that Jesus is the only way to the Father, the only way to heaven, and confess with your mouth he is Lord. And you can make heaven your home right now. So we're gonna pray this prayer as a church because that's what the church is. We're an arm in arm family and an army that sticks together through this thing called life. But before we do, I wanna know if you're making that decision today, I wanna know who I'm linking arms with right now through this decision. So if you're in this house and you're making that decision to follow Christ, would you raise your hand right now? No one's looking around. If you're online with us, I want you just to type in all in in the comment section below. Come on, if that's you, don't be shy. Come on, come on, we love you, we love you. This is a church that is not judgy or guilty. We love you, raise those hands. Come on, raise those hands. Hands all over the room, thank you. Come on, raise that hand, yes. Yes, yes, best decision you will ever make in your entire life. We're gonna pray this prayer with you. Let's say it together as a church. Father, Father forgive me of my sins. Me of my sins. I, believe I believe with all my heart, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. I confess with my mouth today, I with my mouth today. Jesus, Christ Jesus Christ is Lord. I make him Lord of my life. Help me today, God, me today, to God. change for your glory, in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. You know, Easter is all about remembering what Jesus did. Every year, celebrating his death, his burial, and most important, his resurrection. And this morning, we want to remember what Christ did in a way that he did with his disciples the night before he died. And that is, he received communion with them. So this morning, if you have your communion elements and you want to participate, we'd like to invite you to stand with us. You can take them out. You can take the bread out. Jesus, the night before he died, he sat around a table with his disciples for what's called the Last Supper. It was really, it was the Passover meal he was having with them. And he took a loaf of bread and Jesus took the bread and he pulled off pieces and he passed them around to each of his disciples and those that were with him. And he began to explain to them once again that his body was going to be broken on their behalf. And they couldn't fully understand what he meant. But he told them to take and eat that this was his body and that they were to do this as often as they did it in remembrance of him. Well, we now know on the other side what Jesus did. We know what the prophecy said. In the book of Isaiah, it said that he took stripes across his back for our healing. His body was broken, 39 lashes with a cat of nine tails, hitched to a hitching post. Then taking the old rugged cross, I want you to imagine the tree that he spoke into existence was cut down, placed across his shoulders, and he began to carry it through town, down the Via Della Rosa, outside of town, to a hill called Golgotha, where he then stretched out his hands and he allowed humanity that he had created to nail his hands to that old rugged cross and nail his feet to that cross and stand him upright in front of so many people who were mocking and laughing and humiliating him and saying, if you really are who you say you are, come down off of that cross. And yet Jesus in meekness stayed. He remained hanging there, blood dripping 
down that cross, his body so disfigured, Isaiah said, that no one could recognize him. And he did it for you and for me. I wanna ask you just to bow your heads with me and just lift the bread. And I want right now in your own way, those of you at home, those of you in this room, to just begin to thank God. There's really no words that we could ever put together in any language that could say thank you enough for the love that God had for us. The love that Jesus had for you and I, that he would endure the pain and he would endure the shame so that you and I could have salvation, so that we could have everlasting life. Jesus, we thank you today for your body that was broken. We thank you that you remained on the cross, that your strength was made perfect in that moment of weakness, that you hung there and I believe that you were seeing our faces, the faces of those that you were giving your life for, you were paying a debt that we could not pay, yet we owed. Jesus, we thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for your body. In Jesus' name, you may take of the bread. And it said that night that he took the wine and he took a glass and he held it up and he said, this is my blood, the blood of a new covenant. The old was going to be gone. All the things in the Old Testament that they had known was going to be fulfilled with his death, burial, and resurrection. And he said, it is only by the blood that there would be forgiveness of sin. It is only through the blood that we would have redemption. What is that? Redemption means that we were bought back and brought into a real relationship with Almighty God only because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Will you just raise up your juice this morning as we thank Jesus? for his blood that was shed. Jesus, we thank you for the blood that you shed on Calvary, the blood that ran down the cross, that dripped onto the ground that you had created. Jesus, as you hung there, you said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. You knew that it was your blood that was going to bring forgiveness. So Jesus, today we thank you for the blood Thank you for removing our sin once and for all. Thank you for new life in Jesus' name.